Good afternoon. Welcome, folks. We are going to get started here in just a minute, give a chance for folks to log on. Um, we're expecting quite a few folks today. So as people get connected to sound uh, and connected to the webinar, we will get started in just about 60 seconds. All right, looks like we have a critical mass, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today and welcome. Uh, this is the House Bill 1605 webinar series, our, our first of the series. And today we're gonna kick off with a general overview of the bill and the parts that will impact local education agencies the most. Uh, my name is Colin Dempsey. I'll be your facilitator today. I am the Director of District Operations, Technology and Sustainability Support here at the agency. And my team and I are responsible for, among many things, uh, the instructional materials, technology allotments, uh, technology platforms, including TEA Learn and the Texas Gateway, EMAT, our instructional materials ordering system. And we also oversee the instructional materials review and approval process as well as much of the work related to the implementation of House Bill 1605. Uh, today, I'm joined by several of my off-screen teammates who are managing the chat and the Q&A function for our webinar. So we'll have some instructions for you here in a second on those, um, but happy to be here and, and excited to share with you all um, the latest that we have on House Bill 1605. So as I mentioned, today's webinar is the first in a series of webinars which will cover topics related to House Bill 1605. The second webinar in the series is planned for this Friday. So if you're joining us today, I'm, I'm excited to maybe have you join us uh, later this week um, where we will be overviewing the planning and non-instructional duties of teachers um, and how that is impacted by House Bill 1605. Um, while you're here with us, you feel free to scan the QR code or um, visit the URL at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this is going to be your central source for information on House Bill 1605 moving forward. It's our newly launched landing page for House Bill 1605 here at the agency. And on this page, you will see not only registration links for the future webinars, um, but also uh, ongoing FAQs that we will update uh, as people submit those questions. We've been receiving a lot of questions in our instructional materials inbox, um, but lots of opportunities for folks to get information as soon as we have it there on that site. So if you're interested in attending future webinar topic series, um, go to that website and uh, click uh, on register and we will see you at those, those future, future topics. So in today's agenda, we've covered the welcome, but we're going to review the background on instructional materials in Texas, which informed a lot of House Bill 1605. Uh, then we'll jump into the 1605 timeline and implications for local education agencies. Today's main audience are local education agencies, right? Districts and, and charter schools in the state. Um, I think there are several, uh, things in the bill that we will not cover in depth today. Uh, however, we uh, will have some future topics to make sure that folks can uh, get more information on what, on what they're needing. Uh, hopefully, uh, it's the one chat that folks might be having sound issues. If you could, uh, folks use the reactions to let us know that they can hear us. Uh, 
That would be great. Just want to make sure that folks have sound. Great. Okay. I see lots of thumbs up. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, as you're interacting with your Zoom today, I appreciate that. Uh, you can also note there is a Q and A function. If you follow the laser pointer here on screen, Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this is where you can submit your questions during today's webinar. Our team will try and answer as many as they can. Um, any that we don't get to today will end up on that landing page that I just shared with you. The recording will be saved and posted to that same website along with the uh, PDF version of these PowerPoint slides. So um, we don't have it for you here now, but by the end of the week, those will be posted so that you can reference them later or uh, the recording. If you had a colleague or someone else that's not able to join today, you can share that with them at a future date. Um, so great, now that everyone can hear, and we're going to jump right in. So we'll start with an overview of instructional materials in the state of Texas. Um, and we'll start with the question of how is public education structured to ensure students receive a general diffusion of knowledge in our state? Uh, and we'll start with the, the key, which are the Texas essential knowledge and skills. So these are the standards, uh, student expectations that are the foundation of all content found in Texas public schools. and uh, these expectations are great, they're, they're a wonderful outline, but it's, you're not teaching, as everyone on this call knows, you're not teaching TEKS directly to students, but rather uh, you're using instructional materials to convey uh, the essential knowledge and the essential skills uh, that students need to understand in order to be successful. And so again, while the TEKS describe what students should know, they don't necessarily convey content. And uh, we're using the placeholder textbooks here um, but instructional materials can be many things. Anything that convey that material, it could be videos, it could be uh, an online program or an app, um, they do many things, the manipulatives, right? All, uh, we're using textbooks here as a stand-in for all instructional materials. But with those resources, uh, teachers who are the, uh, the, the best resource uh, for providing uh, students information and for teaching, right, are performing the art and science of teaching actively uh, and conveying those essential knowledge and skills to our students so that, uh, at least in our ways that are tested by the STAR, um, they can show their mastery using the summative assessment on the STAR. And that is, in general, from standards to state assessment, how standards-based public education has worked here in Texas. And when we double-click on instructional materials, we know that that's made up of several things. Uh, there's lots of combinations of this out in the field, but in general, uh, you'll have a scope and sequence, which is an ordered list of those student expectations across the school year, uh, depending on how many days of school your particular district has. Uh, you'll see unit plans and assessments. So again, uh, high level outlines as well as aligned assessments, maybe every four weeks or six weeks, depending on how the instructional material is set up. In instructional materials, you'll see lesson plans and assessments uh, to varying degrees of specificity. And then also in instructional materials, you'll see content resources, right? If you're in a, which will vary by subject. So if we're thinking about the reading language arts course, you might see novels or literary works. Uh, if you're thinking about a science course, you might be, you know, uh, paper mache volcanoes or uh, an erosion experiment. I was a fourth grade science teacher myself. Uh, and these content resources, lesson plans, unit plans, scope and sequence, all make up a set of instructional materials. Before 2011, it was the case in the state of Texas that funding was appropriated to the TEA to purchase state board adopted textbooks. Everyone could pick from that list, but only that list. Uh, in 2011, however, for the, the Texas legislature passed Senate Bill 6, which created the instructional materials technology, sorry, created the instructional materials allotment. We hadn't added technology at that point um, to replace the state's direct purchase of instructional materials for districts and afforded districts the opportunity to purchase materials regardless of their approval by the State Board of Education. Uh, the State Board set up a review and approval process, but eliminated the concept, right, of a non-conforming or, or list of materials that districts could not buy. And the minimum approval threshold for these materials is that they had to at least cover 50% of the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. 
And that was true up until this most recent legislative session, which as it was changed by House Bill 1605, and we'll get into that today. But essentially, Senate Bill 6 changed the law so that school districts could now get full state textbook funding, even if they never purchased an SBOE approved textbook, and textbook funding could now be used for other kinds of instructional materials that weren't textbooks. The only other requirement, uh, many of you may have helped complete the annual TEAC certification form where districts must certify that they have purchased enough materials to convey 100% of the TEACs in those foundation enrichment subjects. So that was uh, that's the state of affairs now. And in the field, as many of you all know, again, this looks different in different places across the state, but in general, it's some mixture of this when you walk into Texas classrooms where school districts uh, put together maybe a scope and sequence and unit plans at the district level, but then ask for teachers or curriculum specialists at the district or school level to develop lesson plans and assessments and uh, maybe cobble together content resources. Maybe they have a textbook available to them, but it doesn't have student facing activities. It's more just a teacher guide, so on and so forth. Uh, but it is far less common to visit a classroom where a teacher is following a specific product throughout the year. They may have combined products um, as I mentioned from other places, but in general, this requires much more extensive planning time for teachers to engage in lesson design in addition to the time that they have to teach students. Um, and there's not really enough time in the day to do this extensive planning and also uh, do the prep that a teacher would need to do to be successful in the classroom. And how do we know this? Well, we have, we have some data to back that up, which is um, teachers have reported in a, a report from uh, the New Teacher Project uh, that they spend about seven hours per week or 250 hours per year developing selecting instructional materials. So that process of putting together lesson plans, looking for the correct resources to support their students. Um, and 57% of the materials created, the teachers are doing themselves. And we know that teachers reported that they were only been given about three hours and 45 minutes per week on average to complete those planning activities. Uh, and so when we think about instructional materials and textbooks in Texas, House Bill 1605, the legislature has been following these, these same trends and proposed uh, this bill to return control of instructional materials to the State Board of Education to support a shift back to providing textbooks as resources for teachers. So House Bill 1605 does a lot of things, and, and this is a standards-based uh, approach from the bill. But I think the legislature was also considering recommendations from the Teacher Vacancy Task Force that was convened by the state last year, uh, which also made the recommendation that uh, teachers be given high-quality instructional materials so that they could uh, maximize their planning time and not be required to complete a lot of these activities outside of the workday. Uh, so all that being said, we're going to jump into an overview of the bill, House Bill 1605. Uh, today will be a general overview. It will not be comprehensive. Uh, I've only selected the parts of the bill that I think are most impactful for local education agencies, school districts and charters um, here in the state. If you're joining us and, and that you are not that target audience, it's great to have you, uh, but just know that there might be other pieces of the bill that we go over quickly today that will be a topic in a later deep dive. So what's in House Bill 1605? Uh, I've broken it up into eight key areas that are have strong implications for LEAs. The first is, is that there's more money. So on top of the instruction materials technology allotment, House Bill 1605 provides districts who choose um, specific instructional materials that are going to be approved by the State Board of Education. Uh, it's going to allow for an extra $40 per student of instructional materials funding for those approved materials, and an additional $20 per student if districts select an approved open education resource. Um, if those are new acronyms to you, don't worry, we'll, have, we'll cover those a little bit later here in the presentation. Uh, in addition to new funding, the bill sets up a new process for the State Board of Education to review and approve materials 
supported by the Texas Education Agency. So um, in this section, uh, the SBOE textbook approval is no longer limited to that 50% threshold. Uh, the SBOE will get to decide if a uh, textbook needs to meet 100% uh, or a different percentage of the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. And this bill also uh, abolishes the eight-year proclamation cycle to which some of us are accustomed um, and requires, or sorry, decouples uh, the review of Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills by the State Board of Education from the call for instructional materials. Uh, a couple of other pieces of note for districts in this section is that districts would be exempt from RFP processes if purchasing from the SBOE approved list. Um, and the SBOE is also asked in the bill to develop a list of required vocabulary for reading language arts, TEKS, and a list of required uh, literary works. Um, we won't get into that topic in depth today, but know that, that more on that is coming. It's about a year and a half down the road. So we're going to focus today again on the things that are most pertinent to, to districts in the next uh, 12, 12 or so months. Along with new, that new list of approved instructional materials, there is uh, protections for parent access to instructional materials um, that we'll go over today. There are some teacher time protections. So speaking to that point earlier of, of giving teachers more time. Um, there's some updated reporting requirements that will uh, require districts to, to share uh, what they're purchasing in terms of instructional materials. There's some updates to the Open Education Resource Instruction Material Statute, uh, an exception for Proclamation 2024, which um, is coming up now. The board will be voting that on in November. Uh, for many of you, that's going to be the uh, mostly a science materials purchase. Uh, there are some tech apps and some other CTE courses that are part of Proc 2024, but we'll go over the exception there. Uh, and then finally, a ban or a prohibition of the practice of three queuing. Um, all of these today we'll, we'll cover uh, really quickly, rather, we've only have an hour. Uh, but again, these will be topics that we will deep dive into over the next couple of months as the board makes some decisions and as we get more clarity on the implementation of the bill. So we'll start with that additional funding. Uh, so there is additional funding for instruction materials in House Bill 1605. And you may have heard a $40 or a $20 amount. Um, and so I have this table here. Again, it's a dense slide, but essentially the instructional materials and technology allotment was restored to traditional levels, roughly 1 billion per biennium as part of the General Appropriations Act for the 88th legislature. So when the ledge set the budget this year, they returned that instructional materials and technology allotment back to its traditional level. Um, it was much reduced the previous biennium uh, because of ESSER funding and, and a mix of other factors. So that's been returned, which is great news. On top of that return funding, the bill establishes two new foundation school program entitlements for use with these newly approved instructional materials. And I'll go over that here in this chart. Uh, so you'll notice uh, in the top column, pull up my laser pointer here, we have uh, that lower biennial allotment from two years ago, and then the most recent biennial allotment that was returned to historic levels here. Um, as a district, you, you may have received the to the administrator addressed publication. Uh, we'll provide the link to that for folks, but you can see that down here, the details of how much your district was allotted and, and that was officially deposited into your EMAT account on September 1st of this year. So with the bill, like I said, there are the traditional instruction materials allotments here, the new $40 per student allotment, which can be applied to purchases of materials approved by the board in this new review and approval process. Uh, and then we have an additional amount of funding, which is $20 per student every school year that can be applied to the printing of open education resource instruction materials that are also approved by the board. So this new funding uh, exists, right? Uh, we, we have it on our, on our spreadsheets and, and ready to load into EMAT. However, it requires the board to already approve, uh, review and approve instructional materials. Uh, as we'll see in a timeline coming up, that is a ways off probably November of 2024. So while this money uh, has been appropriated, it won't be available for use by school districts until the board 
establishes a review process, completes the review process, and puts approved materials on that list. These funds do not apply to things currently adopted by the State Board of Education. Only things that will be uh, reviewed in the new instructional materials review and approval process moving forward will be uh, considered fair game for these spending amounts. So what does that mean for you all bottom line is that the total allotment for the 24-25 biennium, including this new state aid, uh, is considerably higher than traditional instructional materials allotments. And these are entitlements that are, are now baked into statute, uh, which is great news for folks who know that the, the cost of these materials has risen um, and need have asked and the legislature has responded for, to provide uh, more funding specifically for instructional materials and technology. Next, we'll talk about the new list of approved instructional materials. So as I shared, the, there's new authority for the State Board of Education uh, outlined in House Bill 1605. Prior to this, every eight years, the SVOE was required to issue an instructional materials proclamation uh, and then sign new contracts with publishers. That is no longer the case. And uh, the board will now be able to review materials uncoupled from that eight-year cycle. So they can review materials every year if they choose to add more materials to the list. So they, their ability to review materials uh, has increased and they also must issue a proclamation for instructional materials and stop materials if they change the TEKS. So um, there's some guardrails there, right? They're not gonna be changing the TEKS without materials being available for school districts but it does give the board a lot more authority in, how, in what they can review and how often they can review instructional materials. Along with what they can review, uh, the board was given new authority in House Bill 1605 to review more than just the TEKS alignment percentage, right? So the current process only allows for this first box on the left, which is to say that if an instructional material uh, covers at least 50% of the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, then it is considered proficient, right? If it doesn't have any factual errors or some other specifications, and it's placed on the adopted list by the State Board of Education. House Bill 1605 expands the uh, review of materials to include not only that minimum TEKS percentage, does this instructional set of instructional materials actually cover the things that we know of a third grader, for example, needs to learn in mathematics in the state of Texas, um, but also ask the State Board of Education to consider the quality of the resources, whether or not the resources are suitable and appropriate for the grade level, whether or not uh, the materials contain factual errors, um, and ensuring that materials meet physical and electronic specifications, and that materials approved for this process uh, meet the standards of uh, providing a parent portal so that parents have access to the instruction materials that are being used at the district level. So again, this is an expansion of the board's authority and their ability to um, review the quality of instructional materials. This does this is a change from the current process and uh, the board has a lot of decisions to make over the next couple of months in order to unlock that funding that I shared earlier. I'll come back with my pointer. I'll be, I'll be busy with the pointer today. But so there are, there are a couple of key deadlines. The board has indicated that they'd like to try and make the funding available in time for use in the 25-26 school year. And planning backwards from that time, right? So that's gonna be August of 2025. Uh, the board would need to have reviewed and approved instruction materials by November of 2024. And so if the board can uh, review a set of instruction materials by that time and approve instructional materials by that time, then you as school districts would have more than enough runway to use uh, your new allocated funds on any of the materials approved and placed on that approved list in time for the 25-26 school year. Um, however, there's a, there's a lot for the board to do between uh, we're, we're right here uh, and in April of 2024, and I'm going to walk us through that timeline step by step here on the next few slides. 
So we'll start with the instructional materials review and approval timeline. And I'm not sure if I explained this acronym before, but this is our new acronym for the review of instructional materials and approval of those materials by the State Board of Education. And so in June of 23, uh, so a couple months ago, uh, the SBOE held a work session discussing the background of this bill. A lot of these same slides were shared with them. And uh, the commissioner laid out for the board the set of decisions they would need to make between now and November of 2024 in order to get to that 25-26 uh, implementation timeline. Uh, we'll share links to these sessions. They're also on that House Bill 1605 landing page for folks that want, it's an eight hour session. This is the one hour version. Uh, so if you want more detail and want to hear the conversation of the board, uh, feel free to click on those. Um, and I think Megan will share those in the chat with folks. At our most recent board meeting, the board discussed the overall review and approval process. Uh, so staff made um, kind of the opening salvo of how we, how we think this will be accomplished. And uh, the board began discussion on how we would operationalize the review and approval of instructional materials moving forward. Uh, we also have uh, that recording available for folks. In addition to the process, the board discussed that quality rubric. So how will we decide whether or not an instructional material is good in the state of Texas? Uh, and so our team here at the agency laid out uh, their thinking on that uh, and was able to share initial thoughts with the board um, who asked then the agency to move forward on creating rubrics for the following content areas. So in our last board meeting, uh, the state board advised staff to begin building rubrics aligned to English reading language arts grades K through five, English phonics, right, K through three, Spanish reading language arts, Spanish phonics, and mathematics grades K through 12. These content areas and grade levels are what the board has indicated will be part of the first instructional materials review and approval process in the summer of 2024. So it would be likely that materials aligned to these content areas and grade bands will be available and you'll be able to utilize the new funding outlined in House Bill 1605 for materials aligned to these content areas. I'll make a note that during that meeting, the board, uh, knowing that there's an exception for Proclamation 2024, stated that Science materials will not be on this first set of, on this list, and it likely won't be on the second list. We can't make any guarantees. But uh, all that to say is that you shouldn't be worried as a district that if you are going ahead and making a purchase for Proclamation 2024, uh, that the board will come up with a new list in the next 12 months. Rather, you should move forward with Proclamation 2024 as you had planned. So if you're purchasing science materials or some of those CTE materials um, for use, in the 24-25 school year, then you should continue to do so. And details on that decision and on these content areas can be found in a proclamation TAA that we shared uh, last week, which also had links to this webinar. So hopefully if you're here, you saw it through that, that avenue uh, and already knew this information. So in the November board meeting, uh, these are all now tentative timelines because it's I, <laughs> the board is their own body. Uh, and so we've made suggestions about how they can get there and we're sharing with you all what we assume will be uh, the timeline for them to get to that November 2024 uh, deadline. So in our upcoming November 2023 board meeting, the state board will begin discussion on the following instructional materials review and approval criteria process and related rules. They'll need to set the criteria for the review, meaning what's the minimum TEKS percentage that the materials will need to cover? How will we measure the quality? How will we define whether or not the material is suitable or appropriate for the grade level? Uh, they'll probably recertify the current definition we have for factual errors in instructional materials. They'll also need to decide the process, right? How do we select the materials that will be in the first batch, which was a little bit of the discussion we saw on the last slide. Uh, instructional materials review procedure, right? There's a, there's a whole set of, of rules in administrative code, chapter 66, that will need to be revised given uh, the new authority of the state board um, and new changes coming from House Bill 1605. As part of that, they'll need to decide how the public will participate in instructional materials review requirements. 
Uh, and they also have some decisions to make around the physical and digital material specifications, the parent portal requirements uh, that we mentioned earlier, and um, instructional materials contracts that the state holds with publishers and the standard terms and conditions we use there. So the board has a lot of things to discuss and a lot of things to decide, and they'll kick that off in November of this year uh, and continue to discuss and make decisions into a special meeting in December and another meeting in January of 2024. So that we have a three meeting cadence for folks to see the process publicly uh, and to add their input as well. By April of 2024, the board will need to finalize all of the review criteria decisions and the process decisions uh, that I outlined a few slides back. And the reason for this April deadline is that we, we need the time to actually conduct the reviews over the next several months. So between May and August of 2024, the agency will conduct the review of the first batch of instruction materials in the Emmer process. The only materials that can be reviewed are ones that have a confirmed quality rubric, which will be those content areas that I showed you on the previous slide uh, where the board has suggested, hey, let's focus on those first. So that's um, the K5 RLA, the K3 phonics, and the Spanish versions of those, and then K12 mathematics. So over this time, uh, the agency will be conducting the review. We'll need a lot of teachers to help us with that. So if you're interested in, in participating in this process, we'll be sending out some recruitment flyers soon uh, for we want these materials to be reviewed by Texans for Texans. Uh, and the more uh, educators we can have involved in the process, the better. So um, a plug there for our future recruitment efforts for this review process in the summer of 2024. Following that review, House Bill 1605 requires uh, the agency and the commissioner to turn over what they found in the review and to make a recommendation to the State Board of Education about whether or not it should approve these materials. The board will review those reports in September of 2024, uh, and that's the chance for more public testimony to be taken on any of the materials under consideration. I, I failed to mention on the last slide, I'll go one slide back. Uh, that materials as part of this review will be open for public comment as well as they are during the current proclamation process um, where uh, anyone can log in and see samples of the materials and provide public comment. But uh, the September 2024 meeting will be an opportunity to do that formally as well. And if all goes well, in November of 2024, the board will then make a determination about the instruction materials that were reviewed. Uh, they have several options, but the main ones will be to either place the materials on the list, uh, they can reject the materials, or they can take no action and have the materials go through the process again. They can also make suggestions for the materials to be approved, uh, to be improved for their approval as part of this process. At that time, once the board has approved materials, uh, that is when that new funding, as I mentioned earlier, will be unlocked. So again, we are here <laughs> on this timeline, uh, and we have lots of time between now and November 2024. So I've gotten a lot of questions in my role about, hey, how does this new money work? Um, and we'll have a deep dive topic webinar about that coming soon. Uh, but there's not really a need for the district to worry about that funding. Um, until 2024, right? As we get closer to this November timeline when the, the funding will be unlocked for districts to draw down again. As a resource in December of 2024, that's when we plan as an agency to have two new updates for you on this next slide. So in December of 2024, we will have had uh, a review of materials. The board will have approved a set of instruction materials on the approved list and the agency will launch a, a website to assist school districts in locating and selecting instruction materials. This website was provisioned in House Bill 1605 and is meant to be a place for districts to compare, for districts to shop and compare pricing for all of the materials that were or are reviewed. In addition, we plan to have an updated EMAT. This is our instructional materials procurement website uh, that has an improved user experience design and more easily conveys uh, the three buckets of funding that we mentioned, right? Uh, so you'll be able to quickly see, like a bank account, uh, how much money you have in your instructional materials technology allotment, how much money you have in your $40, how much money you have in your $20 allotments moving forward. 
you do not see these funds right now <laughs> in EMAT as we're working to update the system. Um, and you wouldn't be able to spend the money until, again, well until November of 2024, right? So not until materials are approved. Uh, and again, this is a tentative timeline. Uh, so we're working to put the figures into EMAT so that you can see that. However, please know that you wouldn't be able to draw down from the fund. So if anything, it's going to be, you know, behind a glass case uh, until um, it's approved to be released when the board approves instruction materials in November of 2024. I think the, the other thing is that that was just the 23, 24, 25 timeline. This is going to be an iterative process as we create more quality rubrics for all instructional materials and all subjects. Uh, that are required in House Bill 1605. The board is now allowed to review partial subject instructional materials. They are allowed to review supplemental instructional materials. And so this will be a multi-year iterative process. And so I think it's important for folks to understand we are just today talking about the first wave of materials in this time frame, but that we will add subjects and courses over time uh, as this will become an annual process of review of instructional materials. Finally, I'd like to note that there is a, a portion of House Bill 1605 that asks the State Board of Education to revise the English language reading, sorry, English language arts and reading TEKS by adding an addendum of required vocabulary and required literary works. Um, the board has asked the agency to go research this <laughs> and come back to them a year from now with some recommendations. Uh, so I wanted to note it here that that work is in process, but again, it's not something that we need to worry about in you know the next five years uh, as we as we look towards 2027 and 2028. Uh, but once those TEKS are revised, the board will be triggered to call for materials and do a review of English uh, language arts and reading materials at that time. I'll do a time check here. This is the biggest chunk of the bill. Uh, so we have about six more sections to go with about 20 more minutes. So I'm gonna uh, move speedily through these other sections, but please, again, if you have an FAQ, submit it, um, or sorry, if you have a question, submit it through our uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, all of those we will eventually address and get to and, and include on in our House Bill 1605 landing page. Uh, the next, section of the bill that, that's important for local education agencies are the provisions for parent access to instructional materials. Uh, so there's two main ones that I'll talk about today. The first are the parent portals for instructional materials. Uh, I've had a lot of questions about this one, but essentially publishers who submit their instructional materials for review by the state board through this new IMRA process, uh, they will be required as part of getting approved in that process to host their materials on a portal. Uh, this is at their expense. This is not a requirement of the school district, uh, but rather uh, an opportunity for districts to offer access to the material digitally. Uh, it has always been the case, and still is law, uh, that districts are required to allow in-person access to instructional materials for parents, uh, but House Bill 1605 outlines this parent portal as an acceptable option if it was reviewed by the instructional materials review and approval process, the EMR process and approved by the State Board of Education. Uh, this is not required of all instructional materials, again, only those going through this new review process, but the in-person access still applies to all instructional materials inside of the bill. It's also a section of the bill that outlines parent requests for local review of classroom materials. So in the bill, parents may request a review of instructional materials used by a classroom teacher in a foundation curriculum course to determine the degree to which the material corresponds with the materials that the local board adopted at the district level and the degree to which the materials meet the level of rigor for the TEKS at that grade level. Uh, this is a process that is still to be determined in rulemaking. It's another one of these things the, the board, the state board will need to decide and to advise local boards on how to set up their policy. Um, so again, this will be this could be an hour or two hour session in and of itself. Uh, but just know that there is grant funding that will be available to assist local education agencies in conducting these reviews uh, as they can be requested by parents. 
as well as rules around uh, the frequency and quantity of reviews that can happen during, a, during an academic year. Uh, moving on from parent transparency, we'll get to some of the teacher time protections. As I mentioned, one of the findings of the Teacher Vacancy Task Force was that access to high quality materials would reduce the amount of time teachers are searching for and curating materials. Uh, and I think the legislature responded by adding some of those provisions into uh, House Bill 1605. The first is a bit of a paperwork reduction. So if a school district has adopted one of those high quality instruction materials that includes uh, unit and lesson plans, then there's no need for a teacher to then submit their own uh, copied version of those materials, right? Uh, if the lesson plan exists, um, then a teacher doesn't need to spend their time recreating something that already exists. This will be the topic of our session on Friday morning. Uh, so if you have more questions about this, please, please join us. We have some great scenario-based questions and some more resources. Uh, we'll be excited to see you all there on Friday. The other teacher time protection is around protecting a teacher's biweekly planning time, that, that protected 450 minutes every two weeks. Uh, where a teacher cannot be asked to create initial instructional materials unless there's a supplemental duty agreement with the teacher. Again, I've gotten a lot of questions on this particular section of the bill, uh, so much so that we are dedicating that Friday morning session to this topic alone. Uh, but uh, these new supplemental duty agreements only apply or start to apply to contracts for next school year. So there's plenty of time for you as a district to plan and understand the, the new statute, um, as well as, as understand the nuances that are, that are in this section of the bill. House Bill 1605 also updated some reporting requirements for school districts around instructional materials. The first is a report to the agency where a district will need to tell us here, tell us, inform our staff here at the agency um, what instruction materials they are purchasing and the cost of those instruction materials, regardless of the source of funds. And the reason for that is uh, publishers should be giving the, <laughs> the same price to every school district in the state. And the only way that we can know whether or not publishers are following that mandate uh, is if we know what districts are paying. And that's not always clear at the state level. So the hope is that this report to the agency will help us to level the playing field for smaller districts um, and for anyone looking to get a fair price on instruction materials out in the field. In addition to this report to the agency, uh, there is the annual teacher certification process, which has been updated to include some things that were already in administrative code, like uh, certification that you are following the Children's Internet Protection Act, uh, but also, uh, things around not uh, protecting children from um, content that they shouldn't be seeing inside of instructional material. So uh, again, this will have its own dedicated uh, topic and webinar session, but wanted to overview it here for folks as we overview the bill. The next session is about open education resource instructional materials. Uh, and I wanted to take this opportunity to define those, but the TEA has been authorized to acquire open education resource instruction materials under the law since 2009. Uh, so that hasn't changed, but House Bill 1605 was added more clarity on and guardrails around what the commissioner should be procuring for use by everyone in the state uh, and how those materials can be distributed. Uh, OER materials are essentially materials that are owned by the state and available to all Texans to use. They can download them for free in PDF form, they can print them, um, and House Bill 1605 requires the TEA to purchase and or develop full subject tier one instruction materials for English language arts and for math uh, in grades pre-K through eight. And then also have asked required of the commissioner to develop a full subject tier one instruction material for grades K through five that would cover all of the core subjects. So uh, English, math, science, and social studies. The idea here is that it could be one set of instruction materials for, for example, a self-contained teacher in early elementary. So they're not having to switch between seven different resources <laughs> in their 240 minutes of instruction during the day. So uh, the goal here is that these open education resources will be the gold standard for quality instruction materials in the state of Texas and a, a freely available option for districts who want to access them, uh, although there will be a charge for printing of these materials. 
And I'll take a second here to double stamp that, uh, that high quality instruction materials in Texas will be defined by the State Board of Education through the EMRA process. So um, high quality instruction materials is a, is a term that has a loose definition to, to several people. And I think moving forward in the state of Texas, HQIM will be defined by this quality rubric and the review process. So materials that eventually are placed on the approved list will be considered high quality. Um, and our OER materials will need to uh, go through the same test and be verified that they are quality and rigorous and suitable and appropriate and all of the other things uh, that the instructional materials review and approval process will be outlining. If those materials are approved, uh, so the state will submit those through the process just like any other publisher, uh, then the materials will be eligible for that additional $20 per student outlined in House Bill 1605. An important note here is that um, if an OER material is approved, then not only is the $20 allotment available to districts, but also the $40 because it's an approved instructional material. So uh, when choosing one of these OER products, you'll have access to all of those funds, your original instructional materials, technology allotment, the $40 allotment, and the $20 allotment moving forward. That is to say, these OER materials, uh, we are a local control state, and uh, LEAs may adopt open education resources at any time they wish. Uh, they can't be charged for choosing to adopt them maybe off cycle. Uh, and in addition, the agency cannot require a school district to adopt or use OER materials, right? So um, I think when folks hear that the state is developing materials, there might be a fear that everyone will be forced to use them. That is not the case. Uh, these are meant to be a resource for districts who want to use them uh, and be made, and the, the state is making them available, and the legislature has found it important for the state to make them available to school districts so that there is a high quality option for every child and teacher in the state of Texas. Um, but again, uh, your local board will be the decision maker around which instructional materials are approved for use in your local district. Uh, so I wanted to double stamp this again that the agency saving any other provisions and statute cannot require a school district to adopt or use these OER materials. And finally, in OER, uh, we will be, House Bill 1605 has set aside funding to set up a repository, basically a digital library of the instruction materials owned by the state, um, where we can get input from parents and teachers and, and anyone across the state on uh, improvements that should be made to these materials, as well as have an opportunity for individuals who maybe aren't affiliated with the school to order and requisition their own printed copy at their cost, uh, rather at their expense, uh, as part of this repository. So that's going to be an exciting resource that will be stood up in that same time frame as those other websites that I shared earlier in December of 2024. A time check, we have 10 minutes and two more, two more sections. Um, so I mentioned earlier that House Bill 1605 has an exception for Proclamation 2024. Essentially, uh, Proclamation 2024 got started in April of 2022. And the legislature recognized that many of these materials have already gone through an intensive review. Uh, the board was due to adopt these materials in November of this year and didn't want to confuse the field. So uh, districts should continue forward with their plans for Proclamation 2024 to have materials ready to go in classrooms in the 24-25 school year. Science materials adopted by the SBOE during this proclamation process will be the only ones, as I mentioned earlier, done for a while. Uh, so you don't need to be worried about uh, instruction material whiplash, right? Choosing one and then selecting another a year later. Uh, Again, there's more information on this in the to the administrator addressed publication from 921 uh, that Megan has shared in the chat. Uh, but wanted to clarify for folks that PROC 2024 will continue as planned. The materials will be available for requisition and EMAT for the standard eight year contract. Uh, and that district should continue forward with, with their plan to, to use those materials. I wanted to give us another timeline so, uh, so folks could see this overlaid with the same information. In November, the board plans to adopt instructional materials from that proclamation. Uh, again, there's all of the subjects that were part of that. In June, those materials will be available uh, for requisition in EMAT. 
and then local education agencies should begin implementing those materials in August of 2024 in the 24-25 school year. And finally, we have the prohibition of three queuing. So uh, three queuing was addressed uh, in part in House Bill 3 in 2019, where the legislature required the use of a phonics curriculum that required some other TEA rulemaking. Those rules took effect in April of 22, and the compliant and non-compliant phonics textbook list was published uh, this spring. So districts have already been working with uh, an aligned phonics uh, understanding, right, linked to our reading academies, also mandated by the legislature, uh, where we are doing systemic uh, phonics instruction. And House Bill 1605 further defines three queuing and prohibits that practice uh, in the use of instructional materials and in instruction for phonics curriculum for grades K through three. So this is also going to have its own dedicated webinar. This one is not this Friday, but the following Friday. Um, and so if you're interested in this topic, uh, please be sure to join us for that one and, and register on our webinar link on the House Bill 1605 landing page. Uh, so there you have it. That is a, a very high level overview of uh, the items in this bill. This is a 54 page bill, I believe. Um, so kudos to folks on the call if, you, if you've read the whole thing, but um, we hope to be providing a lot more information for you as we learn it. Uh, these again are the topics most salient for a local education agency. Uh, we'll be hosting other information sessions for publishers um, and for regional service centers moving forward because we know that depending on your audience, uh, there, there's different things in the bill that are gonna be most important to you. Uh, so I appreciate folks joining this morning, uh, or sorry, this afternoon. And uh, I'm gonna take now a second to, my team has been manning the chat. So uh, I'm gonna take a second to look at these Q and A's um, and maybe see what I can answer. If you haven't had the chance or there's still something burning on your brain, please uh, go ahead and select this Q and A and submit your question. If we aren't able to answer it today, we'll definitely get it added to our landing page. Um, you'll see that Q&A window and, and uh, hopefully we can get your question answered. Uh, great, so I have a, I'll start with a couple of questions. The first is, when will we see the first 40 and $20 in EMAT? When can we spend it? Um, so I think I spoke to this a little bit earlier. Uh, the first $40 uh, is appropriated to districts now, but will not show up in the actual EMAT platform until, uh, probably winter of 2024. Uh, we're working on redoing the coding to set it up as three bank accounts instead of one, uh, which is taking some time. Uh, same with the $20. Uh, you likely won't see that until at least November of 2024, as we are working to rebuild our EMAT system for a more streamlined, more friendly user experience. Uh, the next question is to receive the $40 and $20 allotment. Will districts have to purchase uh, all of the SBOE approved instructional materials off of the SBOE approved instructional materials list or the SBOE approved OER list? Uh, great question. So yes, the um, 40 and $20 can be combined. So think about splitting your purchase, <laughs> uh, but uh, the 40 and $20 can only be applied to instructional materials that have been reviewed and approved by the State Board of Education. Uh, so if textbook, if instruction material A was not approved, you can spend your regular instruction materials allotment on, on that purchase. Uh, if textbook B was approved, you can access your traditional allotment, your $40 allotment, uh, but not your $20 allotment. If textbook C, which is an OER material, is approved, then you can use all three funding sources. So again, we will have an entire allotments webinar topic for folks to follow along uh, and to make that crystal clear for you as you're making decisions about fiscal sustainability um, moving forward with the purchase of instructional materials. Question three is how are educators involved in the MR process? It's a great question. Um, there are a couple of advisory boards that have been uh, provisioned by House Bill 1605 that will involve teacher voice. Uh, in addition, uh, the actual review will be conducted by Texas teachers. Uh, so we hope to have as many teachers as possible participating and getting their eyes and hands on those materials during the review process, uh, because we know that the best field tester is someone who will be using these materials every day. Uh, 
Uh, so we're excited to partner with regional service centers. We're excited to partner with uh, teachers across the state and experts across the state, content experts, to conduct these reviews of these materials. And while I, I pick up our next question, I'm going to move us forward. Uh, we love feedback here at the agency. This, uh, this exit ticket is going to help us improve not only this webinar series, but also guide uh, topics moving forward. So uh, if you haven't had a chance, please, please, please uh, use this link, use that QR code. If you close out your Zoom window today, uh, the link will also be available there. Uh, take five minutes to complete this exit ticket to let us know uh, if you found this information helpful, uh, what you'd like to see more of in the future as we make decisions uh, on the EMRA criteria, EMRA process moving forward, and what you'd like to stay informed about as we as we move forward. So um, I thank everyone for their time today. Uh, this is a big bill with with lots of lots of meaty questions <laughs> about how it's going to be implemented, um, and it's our goal, uh, our team here at the agency, to keep the field as informed as possible on these materials. So. Again, thank you for your time today. If we didn't get to your question, I, I promise that we will be adding it to our FAQ uh, website over the next week. Um, appreciate your time today. Thanks everyone here, educators out in the field doing the hard work every day um, of, of getting our students where they need to be. Uh, and hopefully the implementation of this bill will make that even easier and more successful in the future. So thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.